vital issue that's got to be addressed. Um, roughly 17% of children are obese, and it's about 40% are overweight or obese. Um, and what I like to say is that while it is easy sometimes for us to say, well, that adult obesity, it's all about personal responsibility, and those, you just need to, you just need to buck up, and you need to eat better and be physically active, and by golly, that's just, that's just a will issue, a willpower issue. Well, I think we would agree, can't blame the kids. Can't blame the kids. You can't say kids don't have any willpower. We're the ones who created that environment. So it's time for adults to say, we got to figure out what we're doing, what environment we're creating for our young people that has resulted in a situation where obesity is on the rise and we have the fattest children in the world um, in addition to the fattest adults in the world. This thing has decided not to work for me, so I'll be walking back and forth and I apologize. Now, the other thing is, and one of the things that in our committee work we made a point of being sure to address, is that um, obesity and childhood obesity is not an equal opportunity um, afflictor. Uh, if you, depending on race, ethnicity, and on income level, uh, those prevalence rates are different. So when we look at BMI over 95%, that's obesity. Um, Latino boys are literally, they're off the charts. Tw more than 25% and about 20% of Latino boys are obese. When we look at girls, it's African American girls that are off the charts, but you notice Latinas are really very, very close behind, where 20 plus percent are obese. Notice this other phenomenon, which is found over and over again. African American girls go from um, one rate to a higher rate, where almost 30 percent of African American girls between the ages of 12 and 19 years old are obese. When we look at obesity and overweight, that's BMI over 85 percent. Look at these numbers. For whites, it's about a little over 30 percent of kids 6 to 19. For um, African American girls, it's over 40 percent. For Latino, Latino boys, it goes from 47 to 40 percent. You can see that African American boys look more like white boys in terms of prevalence. Latino boys, girls look more like African American girls in terms of prevalence. The point of all that is that in Texas, for example, um, our whole school system is 50% Latino and about 15, maybe 11 to 12 percent African American. There is a higher prevalence of childhood obesity in school systems in Texas just because of race ethnicity than perhaps in um, Montana or Wyoming. Um, and, and actually, those may not be the best states, but I don't even think the American Indian population is so high that it would really be comparable. Um, uh, prevalence of childhood obesity, roughly 10 million uh, children, uh, more than there are people in 40 states in the United States. And I, I had this slide up the other day, and someone who is uh, in the business of doing documentaries wanted to maybe take this notion, how many school buses would it take how, how many school buses would it take to transport all those overweight and obese children in the United States? And again, if you're African American, Latino, or poor, uh, obesity rates are higher. You know, I just remembered that I can look right here and see what the slides say. <laughs> My oh, wife called me Mr. McGee sometimes. Um, so there are consequences to childhood obesity. It's not just a cosmetic issue. It's not just a cosmetic issue. It may reduce life expectancy. There are, um, there are epidemiologists, there are um, scientists, there are medical experts who believe that this cohort of children may have a lower life expectancy than those of us who are in this room. You're more likely to develop high blood pressure, type 2 diabetes, and high cholesterol, not just as an adult, ladies and gentlemen, as a child. So right now, if you are a child who's um, obese, um, the likelihood of high blood pressure, type 2 diabetes, or, um, or uh, high cholesterol is fairly high. 
When I went to medical school, I graduated in 1988, not that long ago, but maybe in your eyes, kind of long ago. Uh, in 1988, when I was in medical school, you know, that's the kind of line I never in my life would have thought I'd be actually saying. <laughs> They'd be sitting where you are and say, oh, those old guys, and I'm one of those guys now. So um, when I was in medical school, we used to talk about um, two kinds of diabetes, juvenile onset diabetes and adult onset diabetes. We don't use that language anymore. It's type 1 and type 2. Type 2 is the kind that you can get because you weigh too much. There's some other risk factors, but obesity is a big driver of type 2 diabetes in children. And what used to be a very rare thing is a fairly common thing in many, many cities across the land. Um, there is a cost associated with diabetes. Um, and uh, again, um, uh, this was a very, very recent article in, in JAMA. Notice the name of the author, The. Um, that would be a great, uh, great name, and I, I, that's disrespectful, so let me take that back. Um, um, uh, it'd be like being it. Uh, so here, here's, the, here, here's some things. Obesity in adolescents associated with increased risk of severe obesity in adulthood. Um, it does have consequences in the moment and for the future that are very important to note. Um, some issues. Are, are we necessarily living a life that would keep us from going down the path that we're going down. And when you read something like this, that only 26% of Americans eat three or more servings of vegetables a day, or that only 23% of meals include a vegetable, and I'm sitting in a room with folks, I bet you're, the meal you just had probably took you over this right there, right? Because you had one of your meals had it, so you probably only eat three meals a day, so you're 33%, and you probably had the, more than the equivalent of three servings, because it's, I think half a cup is a serving. Um, so you're, you're probably over what most Americans are doing on a daily basis, so we've got some challenges. Oh, don't you hit it when that happens, when the person hits the Okay. Um, this is just meant to show that it's really complicated. The IOM has looked at this in the past, um, and there's lots and lots and lots of different influencers of what is childhood obesity. It could be reduced to something as simple as what you eat and what you burn. But what you eat and what you burn is affected by a whole lot of other stuff. Um, this luncheon was one where healthy food was the only option available. You could do that or just drink water. Uh, so, so that kind of forces the issue. If you're in a place where there would have been Snickers bars and, and M&Ms, um, some, like me, might have gone there first and not gone any, gotten any of the healthy food. So it can be a little bit complicated. And oh, by the way, if you're at a Halloween party, um, just the social norm is, well, of course you're going to eat candy at a Halloween party. You're not going to be serving um, vegetables and a nice dip to go with it at a Halloween party. Maybe some would, but, but, but many would not. Um, there are some things that are happening at a different level. I talked about government a little bit. Um, WIC is a federal program. I think it's a great program to look at to see what could we do at the policy level and environmental level about childhood obesity with a program like WIC. Why? Because if Louisiana is anything like the state of Texas, I think it's 75% of children born in Texas are eligible for WIC which means those mothers were eligible for WIC, which means the opportunity to talk to mothers and to talk to uh, expectant mothers and to talk to mothers about healthy eating and, oh, by the way, why don't you just throw in some talk about moving your body and how movement is health is a tremendous opportunity because there's all those touch points that already should be going on. Um, free and reduced lunch breakfast program, another place where there's so many children that are touched by that program that if we did some things to improve the quality of food that's being served and maybe assure that in schools children were moving their body every day, we might be able to do something. And the evidence is that it does make a difference. And SNAP is what used to be called food stamps, food for the poor. And right now there is a, um, there is a raging debate about whether um, formulating a new food package as was done in WIC. In WIC you can't get a uh, Wonder Bread anymore. You can only get whole wheat bread. You can't get whole milk for your kid if that child is over two years old anymore. You can only get 2% or less. Um, so that's been reformulated. Good, bad, or otherwise, it's been done. So now there's policymakers saying, well, why don't we do that in SNAP? Why can you 
get things in SNAP where people are standing in line saying, wow, that doesn't make any sense. And again, I'm not saying what's right or what's wrong. It's an area that's right for some discussion and some, and some serious debate. There's no doubt about that. Schools, as I mentioned earlier, now there's a place where you have a captive audience of kids. Um, healthy food ought to be the norm all the time. Regular physical activity, every day moving your body. Remember, if you don't, it's 60 minutes a day for kids to be moving their bodies. 30 minutes would be a good way to, a good, a good start to getting there. And coordinated school health programs are those kind of programs that are in existence. One of them is called Coordinated Approach to Child Health. That would be CATCH. Um, there are other programs out there. I know that one well, and I know that acronym because that's out of the University of Texas School of Public Health, PRC. Um, and they are doing a tremendous job, have some good evidence about reversing childhood obesity in El Paso, Texas. If you look at the demographics of El Paso, Texas, you have to conclude if you can do it in El Paso, you can do it anywhere. And they've done it in East Austin. East Austin is that part of Austin that looks more like El Paso, and they've been able to do that there. Um, so schools are a place where really good work can be done. So, Diego and I were invited to participate in a local government actions to prevent childhood obesity committee. And the idea was to look at those places, not including school and the school hours, about what things could be done at the local level by local government and or those who work with local government, community uh, groups that might advocate for certain things. What are those things that could make a difference? Uh, we issued our report in September of 2009. Um, uh, Diego and I were both on the committee. Here's the list. This PowerPoint will be available to y'all if you want it. Uh, and actually, uh, the brief has the list of members, and I think there's a copy of the brief for everyone there. Um, some of the thinking is that local government is uniquely positioned to create healthy environments for children. They, they, they're, they're involved in zoning, uh, 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 zoning regulations. They're involved in deciding who gets to put a, a, a strip mall where, who gets to put a shopping mall where, where streets get laid, where parks go, a whole host of things that they're in, involved in. And they have jurisdiction, as I mentioned earlier, over many, uh, many, many, many parts of daily life. The methodology was a literature review, scanning things that have been done by local governments and partnering organizations. There was an evidence analysis. And I'll be honest with you, one of the challenges is that there's a, there's a, there's a dearth of stuff out there. Uh, there's a paucity of evidence. Um, and many of the studies don't lend themselves to um, kind of working through all of these bullet points. And God knows, and Diego and I definitely know, we debated this issue uh, back and forth a fair amount because we wanted to be scientific and have some rigor around the things that we were saying. But the truth is, right now, there isn't enough to be as rigorous as we would like. And we had to sort of do the best we could with what we had. And I think that might best describe how the report was done. Uh, there were some criteria. It had to be within the jurisdiction of local government. It couldn't be during school hours. Um, and where evidence was lacking, there needed to be a logical connection. In other words, it probably is true that eating more fruits and vegetables as opposed to eating more Snickers bars um, is good for you. Now, let me remind you, you probably saw two weeks ago that Kansas uh, researcher who went on a candy diet and lost weight. Okay, here's the key, ladies and gentlemen. He was only eating 1,800 calories a day, and he was a grown man. If you eat 1,800 calories a day of um, grapefruits, of eggplant, of Snickers bars, and you're a grown man, you will lose weight. Now, I would contend that if you follow that same, those same three for a period of time, eating the Snickers bars, I just cannot believe, is ultimately going to be as good for you. But I could be wrong. Although, if you were just eating grapefruit and, um, um, and eggplant, Snickers bars probably has a few more things that are essential nutrients. Uh, just, just by virtue, I think Snickers bars have nuts, but I could be wrong. I don't, I don't eat them enough. They, they do or don't. 